All right, friends, we're going to walk through uh, what we found for responsible AI. Does anybody from the reliability and safety, whoever did these slides from one of the two groups, do you guys want, does somebody want to share their information? Uh, yeah, I can do mine. Perfect. Um, do you want me to just say it? Do you want me to share it? Whatever, whatever you prefer. If you want to share uh, your screen, you totally can. I uh, can. Yeah, let me um, go ahead. Screen and. Is this coming through all right? Yep, it's coming through great. All right, so um, what I had picked up was when they're developing like the AI systems, uh, there needs to be consistency with like the values and the principles of the people who like make it um, in order to not you know hurt people when these AI systems are like, pushed out. And so if there are some like consistent mistakes that it's making and it's well documented, then these uh, uh, AI systems will still be pushed out for production as long as the risks are shared with the users. And, you know, a couple of examples I gave was like, you know, self-driving cars, so you think like Tesla, uh, and how, you can think of how some things have gone wrong. If you ever see the news about it, you know, self-driving car crashes into whatever, right? So that's probably a risk that they share with the users. Um, and I don't know the car brand, but I know like I've seen the commercials for the car that like detects the collision that's about to happen and it'll automatically apply those brakes to the car. Yeah, this is a really interesting point uh, just because, you know, you start thinking about life experiences. I have a toy Toyota RAV4 uh, and it does this, right? It applies the brakes. And I have a mm. friend who wasn't paying it. And, and it's like, it, it's scary sometimes, but it is helpful, right? There's been moments where I was not, I was, I was distracted. Um, and you know, I, it stopped for me before I hit a car. Um, and it's scary, but you know, it can have its own issues. And a friend of mine sort of was doing the same thing, was distracted. Um, and then actually ended up rear ending somebody. So there is this instance of, you know, it can kind of get sort of muddy, when you have a salesperson, right? That part of the selling point is, hey, this prevents you from in sort of traffic, rear ending somebody, it will stop your car. But then in, in his instance, his car didn't stop. It didn't blink, it didn't do anything. Mm. Um, and so this is this idea, exactly like what you were saying, you have to share that it, you know, most of the time, 99 or 98% of the time, it will stop the car. But there is a, you know, there is, it's not a hundred percent guarantee or yeah, else there is the risk. Yeah, there is a risk in, in identifying and saying, you know, 99% chance of doing this, there is still a risk of, you know, that 1% that doesn't. So, I mean, yeah. you think about it and I was reading, there's a great book called Freakonomics that talks about some AI stuff, uh, talks about a bunch of like economic stuff, but, you know, you think 99% is really accurate, right? But let's say that um, there's a million RAV4s out on the road. That still means what? That 10,000 of them are not going to work. And when you start putting in like 99% of a million, it's still the 1% is 10,000. That's still a lot of cars that are going to break, right? That are not going to work. And so when we start dealing with AI, we, you know, 96% is not a great number because that is 40,000 are going to malfunction sort of idea. So way to go. That's great. Um, privacy and security. Anybody want to share that? Oh, does the other person who did um, reliability and safety, do you guys have any, for the other group, do you guys have anything to add there? Uh, privacy and safety or security. Anybody who did that one want to share? Well, I guess I will. Um, privacy is dealing with users' data. Basically, you want to keep make sure it keeps all. It, it, you get your users the data. The machine learning shouldn't be able to pull that data and put it in a database somewhere and use it. Um, the user's information should remain secure. So we got medical records, school records, and so forth. If those are on your phone, like the medical records, those should be used on the phone and not transferred up to uh, the AI. Um, 
that's basically it. It's just making sure that people's privacy or private information stays private and doesn't get ever get transferred to somebody else by accident or anything else. Yeah. I and mean, this is becoming more prevalent, right? When you start having COVID vaccination stuff and, and, you know, in Seattle, at least in order for me to get into a restaurant, I have to show proof of vaccination. And so that can sometimes have some, some information that is supposed to be secure and, and supposed to be safe. And so if we have an application that's using these sort of things as privacy and security can be a, a big deal. So great job. Or maybe even you think about it, people will use AI to decide if a person should get a loan or not, right? So based yeah. off of some, some qualities, they submit some information. Well, when you try to go get a loan, if you've ever done it, you have to give your social security, right? You give away all of your information that if somebody wants to steal your identity, that is there. And so we have right. to make sure that that information is doing it. And, and it's sort of that same example I was giving. This, this is a really good example. That same example I was giving about Apple trying to move towards a model that um, prevents, you know, explicit images of children, that's the big deal. It has to be on your phone. It has to be to a way that nobody, right? Not a worker, not anybody can see that information and it must be secure and private, right? To where there's no trace of that image anywhere. Because again, you might be frustrated that your 12 year old or 14 year old daughter is sending explicit images, right? That's something to hold in hand, but it'd be even worse if all of a sudden your image of your daughter that was supposed to go to one person ended up on the internet because somebody had access to that, right? That's a really, really slippery slope that we have to be very, very smart if we're going to enact anything like that. It must be private and it must be secure because if there is, you know, that image gets out, that's a huge, huge deal. So absolutely. Way to go, Larry. Any, anybody on the other team have something for privacy and security? Cool. Um, next one would be inclusiveness. Anybody want to, anybody who did inclusiveness? From either either group um i guess i could share perfect thank you but yeah okay um so basically the idea of inclusiveness is that uh everyone should have representation or involvement when uh, you are building the ai tools because we want the resulting tools to benefit everyone who may use it and if you uh accidentally not include some people in the development of tools, you will, it will result in the designing and creating of tools that are biased or um, they would react a different way. So like a very, like a very forced example of this that I thought of, of would be like, let's say I, would, I, were, I was a bunch of game developers who want to create a bot that would read posts about the, um, about the game and it'll basically um, categorize or classify the posts as positive or negative. But during my, you know, during my training of the AI bot, um, I only feed it positive stuff. So the new, like, and maybe some neutral things and only the neutral things would be, you know, would be classified as negative. And then when you throw it into the actual world and let's say my game was terrible, you know, um, the, 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 the final, um, I guess, network wouldn't be able to classify the the comments properly for me. And people would be wondering why, you know, all their negative comments don't, don't seem to have any replies or, you know, or like um, you would think your game is doing well when it's not. Sure. And this is like a really forced example, but the idea is that if you forget like a small thing, even like, you know, 3% of the people who use it or something like that, um, it, it might account for something like really poor as a result of your, um, your, your, your tool or your, your, your network. Yeah. Absolutely. And somebody in the chat said this and, and what you'll see with these, with these uh, sort of responsibility, responsibilities of AI is sometimes they do overlap, right? And so somebody in the chat said that inclusiveness sounds very much so like fairness. And that's so true. And I think that's a great example of you want to make sure you're including everything. A big thing and a real big focus in AI right now is actually including people that um, are not Caucasian. Right. And, and we are seeing that models have been trained for 
various different reasons that um, have a harder time with people of different ethnicities. And so inherently the models that we're seeing in AI that are promoting, you know, whether it's promoting a Twitter page or a Facebook or an Instagram post, something of that nature, or even to the point where it's like, you know, a modeling agency, let's say, is using AI to detect, you know, girls or men submit photos of themselves and they're trying to detect if this person should be a model to where then they actually interview them. Um, if people of color or people who are not white do that, there might actually be some bias built into that AI because of how it was trained and what was attractive and what was not attractive. And so we want to make sure we have the ability to where everybody can utilize this for good instead of, um, you know, sort of dividing a wedge and, and including some exclusivity within our AI model which is huge. I mean, there's, there's a, a, a big sort of contention with AI that there's uh, some AI out there that will detect if somebody should be let out on bail or not, right? And so they will take in a person's information of their life, like different categories, and it will create a predictive model of how likely are they to repeat the same offense. And if it's above a certain threshold, they're not let out on bail. That is a huge issue when you look at the American, um, you know, incarceration system, because it is not at all equal when it comes to ethnicity, right? But yeah, that's it, that. That sounds really racist. It's wild. Yes, struggling. it is wildly biased. Wildly biased because all the data. You might be like, I'm trying to use every data point I can, but even the data in itself is wildly skewed because the system in itself is inherently racist. And so that is this idea of, okay, is this going to be inclusive towards everybody as well, right? Like, not only is it, can we just add white people in this, but it's like, is this actually a beneficial thing for people of color? And if it's not, then that's a huge issue. Or if it's a way of people who identify, you know, not as like a heterosexual, if that's an issue, we have to make sure we're including everybody, people who are part of the LGBTQ community must be included when we are dealing with people of getting a, a house loan or people if they're using AI for like adoption, stuff like that. We have to make sure everybody has a fair and equal chance there versus, you know, it being skewed. And sometimes our data in itself that we train our model in itself is skewed. So we have to be really, really aware of that. Cool. Great job. Um, anybody who the other person who did inclusiveness, you guys have anything to add? Okay, uh, transparency, who did transparency? Anybody wanna share that? Sure, I'll talk on transparency. All right. So there's uh, two sides to transparency. Um, in part, transparency means that people who create AI systems should be open about how and why they're, they're using AI and also open about the limitations of their systems. Uh, transparency also means that people should be able to understand the behavior of AI systems. Uh, this is often referred to as interpretability or intelligibility. So I guess in real world usage, transparency and intelligibility can, can help us achieve a diverse range of goals, such as mitigating unfairness in machine learning systems to helping developers debug uh, their AI systems to gain more trust from, uh, from other users. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great uh, explanation of that. It's just being transparent of what are we using, right? So I think a, a great example would be somebody trying to get a loan, seeing if they're auto approved or not. What are, you know, if you're not approved, but you make, you know, let's say that I am friends with uh, one of my friends of color and I have the same job. We have the same amount of debt, same everything, um, but I'm approved for a loan and they're not. Well, if everything's equal except one thing, you know, we want to be able to ask the, like, what else, what, what were the criteria you used to come up with this decision? Um, 
and being transparent is going to be a, a really big thing as we are moving towards AI of, you know, that's the big issue with Facebook. And that's the big issue with, uh, there's a huge thing with TikTok recently where they're like, what is your algorithm? Because it is, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, whatever the issues were and that, you know, they wouldn't push, they wouldn't share what their algorithm is. And that's everybody's algorithm, their predictive model of how they promote information or promote users or promote X, Y, Z. Um, that's a really muddy thing if we're really talking about it. If we're really talking about companies and Facebook sharing their algorithm, they're very reluctant. But this transparency piece needs to be, you know, for people to feel safe or feel like it's okay. It's an important thing. But when you use something like a com, uh, convolutional neural network, a lot of the, the stuff for how it's used and why they reach a, de a decision is sort of hidden. Sure. You don't know how the computer is doing that. So what do you do in that case? Yeah, I think I think there's ways to, you know, combat and a big issue. So like for transparency, something that recently happened was Google hired within within uh, Google, they hired a team to identify and try to figure out what's going on. Right. Um, and like what you said, that there are some times that they they can't. But then, you know, unfortunately, if you have a model, right, and you're like, I can't figure out, but I know that it's racist, just because you can't figure it out doesn't mean that that's okay. You know what I mean? And so Google hired yeah. an, an in, uh, in-house, basically like an ethics committee. And one of their most prominent um, researchers, uh, doctor of AI, basically came out and said, hey, Google is like, our algorithm is racist. This is a big, big news thing. So it's not like it's, you know, anything against Google. Uh, well, it is, but um, like, hey, this is inherently racist. And Google fired her and it became this massive story. And so what companies are doing is, you know, creating these ethics committees on are we ethical? And the issue that we're seeing is like, well, when they get called out and I'm not pro, I'm not like anti big company. That's not, please don't get that because I keep talking about how bad companies are. Um, and Google does a lot of good, but they created this ethics committee on how to be transparent in trying to show basically like, hey, we're good, we're one of the good guys. And it came out that they weren't and then she got fired, right? And so I think Larry, that's something that companies are still trying to figure out. Um, and when we're talking about transparency, it's what can we do everything we can to help the user feel like they have an understanding. And all of this, gotcha. you know, comes together as one thing of being responsible, right? So there are, like you said, gonna be some things that inherently are out of our control but that's even where we even from the start can say is our data set representative and inclusive right right, right. is it fair towards people of color versus people who are white right like that's where it, it all starts it's an entire process and if something happens you know coming out and saying i you know it seems as if this is leaning towards one way. We maybe in our neural network actually don't know why it's making that decision, but that's not good enough. So we are working or pausing this or, or trying to enhance it in some way, something like that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's just a matter of having enough uh, data points of, you know, black people along with white people instead of just putting all this white people stuff in and not doing anything else. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other, anybody else on transparency? We got two more and then we'll go for a break. Somebody asked in the loan process, if they remove asking your ethnicity, would it make it more transparent? I mean, yes, right, it would. It would be one point that the computer can't use to be an identifier. So yes, I'm trying to think of could it still? I mean, all it things could. It could. That use was the reason. That was the reason why I walked away when they asked me that when I wanted to buy my house and they asked me for my my ethnicity, and I asked the dude. I said, "Hey, what do you need my race for?" Sure. And he said, "I don't know. It's just a question." And I was just like, "All right, well, I'm good." So yeah. Now that's a real thing, right? And and there's so many things, you know, like in the history of the U.S. This is not a history, you know. I'm not. I'm, I'm very pro, like um, inclusiveness. Obviously, I'm very passionate about this. 
but our, our whole even home buying system has been inherently skewed one way for a long time. So yes, in, in theory, ethnicity, taking ethnicity out of it would make it more transparent. But then I think you could argue, and this is more of an ethics thing, so this isn't really AI. But you could argue like people have been set up differently or, um, and I know that there's been strives towards other things to be more inclusive of other people, which sort of has the reverse effect, right? So somebody of one ethnicity might be more likely to receive a loan than somebody of this ethnicity. So the scales are balanced sort of thing. And so it's, it's a really fun line to do. And I'm not, you know, making sort of any stance or anything like that, but a way that we can have uh, inclusiveness and fairness amongst all people should be our goal of AI. That's a, that's a really hard, tough thing, Lance, that I'm not, I'm not sure why or what their model was that desired that if it was, you know, if it was more likely to give somebody something or less likely that that's a huge issue, you know, that's a huge, huge thing that if that is the case, that's not okay. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Um, so I know that uh, when you go to your doctor's office, uh, they ask you for your social security number. Mm -hmm. um, now, why do they need that? That's like, a great question. Is that, is that uh, transparency issue or um, I would uh, probably not I would say that that's likely a insurance issue like because insurance companies in the U.S. obviously uh, this is all speculation I have no idea so you know we're just sort of chatting uh, I would assume that insurance has to make sure that they're paying for you as the user right and that there's not another Will Calhoun trying to claim my like has the same name, address, whatever. They just don't know my social security, but then they're going to bill my insurance company because another Will Calhoun went. Would be my assumption. I'm not sure. Or yeah, maybe like I... probably would be like who the, uh, that's would be my other guess is who's owed the money. Who does the debt be attached to? You know, like- But isn't that insurance uh, has the group number, member ID number. It has all the information, right? But yeah. why do they need a SSN? You know, yeah, as... <laughs> my my as I process through that, yeah. it's probably to who who can I assign the debt to, right? Like medical, I think medical expenses is the number one leader to bankruptcy in the U.S. And it's they they have to assign this debt, this hundred thousand whatever. Unless there's universal health care, they would have to assign the debt to somebody by using Social Security. It's making sure that if I am in medical debt. It's not some other Will Calhoun that's like going bankrupt because I didn't pay my medical bill. If that makes sense. That's my assumption. I have no idea. But that no. idea, yeah. That's, that would just be it. Cool. We're going on a little bit of a tangent. Two more. Accountability. Um, who did this one? Hey, I can go for this one. Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, one minute. So like people should be account accountable for AI system like face recognition. Like it should ensure that they does not break legal and ethical standard. And a real time example, maybe like uh, the police officer, they are given some weapons to use when they are required, but they are accountable for when and how to use it. Another example could be like private details of individuals uh, who, who have access and what purpose they can be used and how they are used can like basically can be a theft of their identity yeah yeah, yeah there's there's um great great job there's there's quite a bit with accountability one of the main sort of thoughts behind it is you need to be accountable for the tool that you create right and so let's say that you are tesla and the idea is that the developers is, is there's accountability across all areas but if you think about it this way right let's say you're tesla you create a car that can detect cars, can detect people, blah, 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 blah. Well, let's say your car is driving and it detects people in a crosswalk, right? Let's say somebody jaywalks and they just randomly cross the street and your car hits them. Well, are you, is the driver accountable? The one using your tool? Are you accountable because you created a model that didn't stop and detect a pedestrian? Or is the, technically is the, um, sorry, one second.
Sorry about that. My dog heard a truck and started barking. Um, or is really the person accountable because they technically broke the law and crossed when they weren't supposed to, right? And so this idea of as a developer, you are accountable for something you use. There's another company, I think it's called BlackRock, and it's uh, an Israel, Israel company, I believe, and they do AI. And, and so basically they use, they have this like surveillance system and they're really big in saying like, hey, we don't own, like how people use this is not our issue. We just provide this service, right? And it's like, no, this, this actual service has been used to spy on journalists. And, you know, that's the idea. That's not me making an accusation. It's been used to do X, Y, Z. And so they're like, nope, sorry, we just do this tool and whatever the user does with it, that's the big issue. And it's like, well, actually, we need to be accountable for the tools that we create, not just, you know, we can't push the accountability. If I, again, create a tool that can detect uh, certain ethnicities of people and somebody uses that in a racist way, I can't just be like, well, they technically weren't supposed to do that, right? It's like, no, 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 you are in charge of the tool that was created sort of thing. So, and just being accountable for what we do and making sure that it can't be used. And we put, you know, stop gaps if somebody does want to use it in a certain way, or we have a licensing fee. And then if they break that, then they can't use our tool sort of thing. Cool. Last one, and then we'll do a break is fairness. Anybody want to go there? I can. Cool. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, let's give me one second. I got to pull my stuff up. Uh, okay, so with with mine, I, I was talking about like so that I, I said in the chat, fairness seemed kind of similar to uh, to uh, inclusiveness. Yeah. Uh, with like what I was talking about, so I might be like kind of repeating some of the same notes here, but uh, it, it was just talking about, like the the video and everything was just talking about how important it are that it is that people aren't discriminated against some of the examples of people that I saw in the video were like people with handicaps or people with uh or like you know uh, people of different race and everything like that and uh at least from my experience it seems like uh like race and uh things of like those talking points are are talked about a lot I mean there's still more work to do and there always will be but uh one of the points that I don't see uh, personally talked about a lot in uh, many areas of tech, not just AI, uh, is like inclusiveness in terms of like economic, making sure people of different economic backgrounds are represented. Yeah. Because within tech, like, you know, people tend to be making like a, a pretty stable income depending on where you live. Uh, and so it can be kind of hard to represent uh, communities that really nobody in that in that team would be able to uh, relate to other than past experience uh, sure. Absolutely. so so that's where I brought up and like some of my I mean my, my main example that I could think of I mean there's other ones when you come to people who aren't homeless but uh, I, my example was homelessness how uh, a lot of companies uh, I've, I've seen different videos and everything talking about how certain cities design uh, different things against homeless people being able to stay in certain spots like benches that are designed to be uncomfortable for people to lay on and different things like that so yeah. Bikes uh, under the bridge sort of thing yeah so like these local government local governments and everything will spend like they have no they have no problem with spending money on uh, things to fight uh, homelessness rather than try to fix it so I, I could see them hiring something like a team uh, to integrate uh, like facial recognition and different things like that into surveillance to try to combat those people. Uh, and it's not really something that I think there would be many people uh, pushing back against or because all, anybody like somebody's going to take that government contract, uh, even if like one person denies it because they don't think it's right. So I think that's a, uh, I think that's a pretty good example. And then another one that in a similar vein, but very different, uh, is uh, how, like, you see uh, the federal government uh, mainly, but looking for, uh, like, domestic terrorism and everything, and that often uh, they use, or at least in the past, they would often use stereotypes to try to find, uh, 
like domestic terrorists and everything and it can be yeah. uh that that could lead to like a lot of false accusations and everything in the name of security but it's not uh, again i don't i don't really see a way of like protecting against this other than being like working in the government itself sure. uh, and trying to fix these kinds of things but these are just some of the issues that i i could see i think that economic backgrounds especially is something that i don't hear talked a lot about in uh tech absolutely Absolutely. And I think that this has been such, such a good conversation and just wrapping around. Thanks, Tyler, for everything you said. Um, all of this is the idea of if we're using Microsoft tools and if we're creating our own AI, these are things we must incorporate. And it is hard because, you know, you see examples of companies who didn't or aren't following these. But this is the idea of if we're going to create something, we need to make sure we're inclusive and we are including and in, in fair to everybody, right? That we are accountable for what we're creating, that we have privacy, we have safety, we have reliability, right? That we have all these different tools to make sure that we are creating the best tool for society versus, um, you know, creating a tool that might make a lot of money, but is pretty harmful to a certain people group or, or uh, you know, something of that nature. So cool. Anybody have any last things to add and we'll, or else we'll take a little break. Yeah, I can add on fairness yeah. since I worked on it a little bit. Um, yeah. So they said the you know ai systems should treat all people fairly and it relates not just the system technical component but also the social context uh, in which system is deployed you know yep. it means that it's social technical challenge um that's what that video explained but then uh, it's just like when a person's creating a machine learning model to support a loan approval application for a bank, right? Uh, the model should make prediction of whether or not the loan should be approved without incorporating any bias, like or in gender, you know, yeah. uh, ethnicity and other factors m might result in unfair advantage uh, to a specific group of people. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, right. Like, I think if we were to say a uh, uh, male versus a female, and there were hedging bets on who was going to make more money, right? Like, there is an issue with that because in our US system, women are typically paid less, right? And so there's a whole, like, like what you were saying, if we're creating the system that created a bias within it, that's an issue. So, well done. Great job, guys. Um, Cool. So we're going to take a 15 minute break. It's 1050 right now. So we'll be back at 1105. Uh, I am assuming uh, all we have to do, not all we have to do now, next, what we're doing is we're talking about machine learning and sort of the process and what machine learning looks like. That's going to take about an hour. So I know that we said till about 1230, I think we'll end up ending at 12 o'clock for lunch. So just if you guys need to make plans, we will end up, this is all Pacific time as well. And so we'll meet back here at 1105 and then we will jump into machine learning. Have a good break. All right, friends, welcome back. Um, this is, again, typically the most challenging portion, if I'm blatantly being honest, and it's only for those who have never dealt with machine learning. We're really just going to focus on terms today. And these terms are going to be used, um, you know, it's going to ask you what a label is and what a target is and, um, you know, what these certain things are using. And so we're just really gonna focus on terms. We're not gonna get into like the code of how to create a logistic regression or anything like that. We're just gonna get very basic. But what's gonna be cool is, um, you know, you're gonna learn a lot and you're gonna have a better understanding of what the actual machine learning process, cause that's such a buzzword right now in tech is machine learning and AI and machine learning and AI, but we're gonna actually really look at the process of what, what, you know, what that actually is doing. So if we're talking about what is machine learning, machine learning is the foundation for most AI solutions. It's a process of a computer or a machine, right? Understanding patterns in data and learning those certain patterns in order to make predictions on new data that we give it, right? And that uses mathematics, uses statistics and creates uh, what we call a model to predict, again, those unknown values. You can sort of think about it like, on uh, Zillow is gonna be a great example that I will use a million times where I can create a model that you know a user can put in 
the square foot of their square footage, the bedrooms and the bathrooms of their house. And I'm going to predict how much their house is worth or what it's sold for. Maybe I would have like zip code, stuff like that. But it's a, a way that I can create a tool that users can put in and say, this is what I can sell my house for roughly. You think of like Kelly Blue Book, right? Same thing with their car. If you've ever used Kelly Blue Book, you put in your car, your year, blah, 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 blah. And it predicts a range of what you would be able to get that car for. Now you might get to have it for more or less, but something of that nature. Here's a video on machine learning that I want to show you because it's cool. Let me make sure that I am sharing my computer sound. Right. Pause it right now. This one's quick. It's only 46 seconds. Right now, artificial intelligence helps us meet the needs of today so we're prepared for tomorrow. By 2050, we need to produce 60% more food. So how are we going to feed the world without wrecking the planet? Using Microsoft artificial intelligence, we can reduce waste and produce more food. Any grower will tell you every row, every crop is different. We can use Microsoft AI to make local predictions about light, wind, rain. This helps farmers know when to plant, irrigate and harvest. It's making a difference. Artificial intelligence helps farmers grow more while wasting less. So that's just a little video to show you sort of some of what uh, machine learning can do. And so here is an example of suppose an environmental conservation organization wants volunteers to identify and catalog different species of wildflowers using a phone app, right? So uh, my mother recently, they live uh, down south and they recently came to Washington and there was all these plants that she had never seen before. And what she did is she pulled out an app and would take a picture of the plant and it would tell her all about it, right? It would identify the plant species, the real like name, um, where it, you know, the regions it exists in, et cetera, et cetera. So let's say the same sort of thing. Well, what would happen for that is a team of botanists and data scientists would collect samples of flowers. Let's just say wildflowers, let's sort of narrow the gap, wildflowers. Then that team would label the samples with the correct species. So they would pick up, let's say a dandelion, and then they would label this is a dandelion, right? And then the labeled data is processed using an algorithm that finds a relationship between the features of the samples and the labeled species. So let's say it's a dandelion and we might say like, oh, it has uh, you know, this many petals or the petals are this size or this length or they're yellow or they're you know, X, Y, Z, whatever whatever some unique things about them are, it has something in the middle. You think of a sunflower, right? That is unique and different than a rose. And they're, you know, maybe the petal length or the petal size or shape, et cetera, et cetera. So then the algorithm uh, takes those results and encapsulates it in what we call a model. So we're just creating a machine learning model. And then when new samples are found by volunteers, the model can, can identify and correct the, the uh, identify the correct species label. So what does that mean, right? We are taking all of these flowers, we're identifying them, creating this model. Then just like my mother did with the app, we can create this model to where if somebody takes a picture, it can identify, oh, based off of the shape of this flower, the color of this flower, the shape of the stem, if it has thorns or not, this is a rose, this is not a sunflower because this has thorns and it has a different shape, right? So that's what this machine learning model can do. We create this model, we train it, and then we give it new flowers and it can identify based on different features. When we're talking about machine learning, there's two uh, main ones. I think there is a, a third, but there's two main ones that we're going to talk about that supervised and unsupervised machine learning. There's one, uh, a third type called reinforcement learning, but that's not what we're going to talk about uh, today. Azure, especially for this AI 900, really only focuses on these two supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Now within supervised machine learning, there's two categories. There's one called regression and one called classification. Let me talk about a little bit of that. Here's another video. Let's go ahead and watch this one. Now this one, what I want us to do is I want us to watch this video then after, uh, at the end, we are going to, this is going to be a little bit more of a challenging video if I'm transparent, not really going to understand the words, but then we're going to watch it again 
to where um, we're going to watch it again to where, you know, and see if you can identify those words. Machine learning is a technique in which you can use data to train a model that predicts unknown information. For example, suppose a bicycle rental company keeps records that include the weather conditions, temperature and seasonal details for the days in which they've operated. And they also record the number of bicycle rentals that they had each day. The weather and seasonal characteristics for each day are called its features. And the thing that we want to train a model to predict, in this case, the number of rentals, is called the label. For short, we often refer to the features as X and the label as Y. We can take this historic data and apply an algorithm to figure out a function that fits the features to the label. In other words, the function calculates Y from X. The function we've calculated is the basis for your predictive model. So if you have the features for a new day, but the label is unknown, you can use the model to predict the unknown label, which in this case is the expected number of bike rentals. This kind of machine learning, where the label your model predicts is a numeric value, is called regression. Now let's look at another form of machine learning. This time, suppose a health clinic takes measurements from patients, including blood pressure, glucose level, weight, height, and so on. Additionally, each patient is categorized as diabetic or not diabetic. The patient measurements are our features, or X, and the classification of diabetic or not is our label, or Y. We can fit the features and labels to a function that calculates the probability of a patient belonging to a particular class based on their features. In this case, the possible classes are diabetic and not diabetic. When the features for a new patient are collected, the model we've trained can predict the probability that the patient is diabetic or not. This kind of machine learning, where the predicted label is a category or a class, is called classification. So far, we've seen examples of regression, where we use historic data to train a model to predict a numeric value, and classification, where the model predicts the class to which an item belongs. These are both examples of supervised machine learning, where we have historic data with known feature and label values that we can fit to a function to train the model. Now suppose you have data that consists of features, like the measurements and petal counts of some flowers, but you have no known labels. You just want to group your items together into clusters based on their similarity. In this case, the flower measurements are our X value, and the Y value represents the clusters into which we want to group the flowers. We can use an algorithm to separate the data values into clusters based purely on the feature values, and the resulting model predicts which cluster each flower is assigned to. Clustering models like this, that are trained without a known label value, are examples of unsupervised machine learning. Regardless of the kind of machine learning model you want to create, there's a typical process that you follow. First, you need to get the data with which you're going to train your model. We call this data ingestion. Then there's usually an iterative process in which you explore the data and prepare it for modeling. Data pre-processing includes steps such as feature selection. In other words, identifying features that are likely to help predict the label and discarding others. Then you might clean the data, for example, by finding outliers or errors and removing them, and imputing missing feature values with a suitable replacement. You might also engage in some feature engineering to derive new features from existing ones. And you should generally normalize your numeric features so they're on the same scale. Then you can apply an algorithm to fit your prepared data and train a model and evaluate its performance. When you're happy with the model, you typically deploy it to a service. Applications can then connect to your service and use it to predict unknown labels from known feature values. Okay, that was a lot. I get that. So let's walk through it. That's everything we're gonna learn this next 45 minutes. Um, Tyler, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just initial impressions. It seems like cleaning the data could be problematic depending on the use case. 
Uh, cleaning the data is you cannot run a machine learning model if your data has not been cleaned. We'll talk about sort of cleaning data, okay. but yeah, you must always clean data. Yeah. Cool. All right. So first off, we're going to talk about supervised machine learning. And so when we have a data set with a labeled target, meaning we know what we're trying to figure out. In this example, it was how many bicycles are we going to rent or does the patient have diabetes or not? We know what we're trying to figure out, either they're diabetic or not, or a numeric value of what we are, you know, of, of how many bikes we're going to do. If we have that uh, identified, what we call a target, if we have that identified, then we can build what we call a supervised machine learning, meaning we know what we want to predict. And so when we have that, we uh, call the column that we're trying to predict our label. Now, I know that sounds a little bit confusing, but what we're trying to predict, it's also uh, sometimes called a target, but Microsoft specifically calls it a label. When we're trying to predict something, what we're trying to predict, either if they're diabetic or not, or how many bikes, is what we call the label and the tools that we're using to make that prediction whether it's the date or blood, uh, like blood work and height and weight, X, Y, Z, those are called features. So the tools we're using to make our prediction is called a feature. And what specifically we're trying to predict is what we call our label. So let's say that we, let's use my Zillow here. And we're trying to build a model to predict price. If I look at this, my price is what I'm trying to predict. So based off of those two words, what is price? Is it a label or a feature? A label? Yeah, it's a label, right? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm Let's just pretend these are empty, right? I'm trying to figure out the price. That is called my label. If I'm using bedrooms to do that, that is called a feature, right? If I look here, square feet is something I'm using to try to predict a price, therefore square feet would also be a feature. So that way that, you know, does that make sense? Are there any questions there? What I'm using to make my prediction is called a feature. And what I'm actually trying to predict from a supervised, this is for all from the supervised side, what I'm trying to predict, we call a label. Any questions on that? So in this case, bathrooms would also be a feature. Now there's two types of machine learnings. There was regression and classification. When what we're trying to predict is, or when our label or what we're trying to predict is numeric, that is what we call a regression problem. So going back to this example, I'm trying to predict a price, a numerical value for my house. That would be what we call a regression problem. When I'm trying to predict a group or category, that is what we call a classification problem. If my group or category is if they're diabetic or not, right? That would be a category that is a classification problem. Now, one thing I do wanna know is sometimes in classification problems, we treat those as sort of binary or you know, one, zero through four, where zero represents one group one represents another group, another category, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So although it's predicting a zero or a one here, the zero and one represent a category. Let's just say zero and one, zero was not diabetic and one was diabetic, right? Although my model would be predicting a zero or one, which is technically a number, the zero or one represents, it is a numerical representation of a category. Therefore, it still would be a classification problem. Does that make sense? The zero and one just represent a category. That's just what we're using to identify the category, but it's still a classification problem. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? I'm sorry, can you go over regression again? I'm yeah. So regression is when we are trying to predict a numeric value. So again, like we're trying to predict the price of a house or the number of users of my application. If I'm creating a model of how many users I'm going to predict that next month, I'm going to gain X amount of users, right? 
those users are going to be, that is a numerical value. That's a regression problem. If I'm wanting to figure out um, any sort of category or group, right? That is going to be what we call a classification because they're in a certain class. And then regression is any sort of numeric value. Any questions on those two? So again, when a label or target is a group or category, that is a classification problem. Okay, so let's say we're trying to build a, predict, a model to predict a price. So here, our Zillow example, which, which is this? Is this a regression, classification, or clustering problem? Uh, regression. regression. Regression, yeah, exactly. Great job, guys. It is a regression problem because we're trying to predict a price. So say we're trying to build a model to predict a passing an exam, right? Whether they passed or failed. What is ours studied? If we're trying to predict if they pass an exam or not, what is ours studied? Feature. feature. Yeah, it's, it's a feature, right? We're using that to make our prediction. It is a column we are using to make a prediction. The score would be what? Classification. And it's label. classification, but what what is the column called? Label. Label, yeah, exactly. Great job, guys. Score would be the label, and what it would be, great job, is a classification problem. Good job, guys. So that is supervised machine learning. We know what we're trying to predict. We know what we're using. That We're using what we call features to predict what we call a label, right? What we're trying to predict, and we know what we're trying to do. Now let's say we don't know what we're trying to do. We just want, we have a data set without a labeled target, without, we don't know what we're trying to do, but we wanna build a machine learning model to find out similarities, similarities of my groups. So when we have a data set without a labeled target, we can build what we call an unsupervised machine learning model. So the main task of unsupervised machine learning is what we call clustering or putting things uh, alike sort of together. Now there is another thing, uh, it's called dimensionality reduction. So that's another unsupervised task, but we're not gonna talk about that. Azure doesn't care if you are interested in that, our data science, um, our data science uh, cohort does talk about that. So if you were in data science, you talked about that. But the main thing that we're focusing on is unsupervised cares about clustering. And so what does that mean? Clustering is the process of grouping together similar observations, creating clusters of similar data points, right? So our computers do this uh, using unlabeled data, meaning we don't know what is right groups or wrong. We don't know the, you know, what we're trying to predict. We are just trying to predict and get things together in a cluster. So we rely on patterns in the data to discover new groups. So here's uh, one that the, the main uh, algorithm that it uses is uh, KNN, so K-means, right? Where it takes this group of data and it clusters them together to where there are similar data points. So let's say we are trying to build a model to group our customers. Let's say we have a bunch of customers and we're trying to individualize marketing, right? If you look at Gen Z, their main things are Snapchat and TikTok, right? If you look at millennials, our main social network is Instagram. And if you look at anything like Gen X and boomers, the, the main thing is Facebook, right? Gen X is sometimes an Instagram too, but Facebook is really the main driver for social media. And let's say my company wants to um, advertise to the different groups, right? Now I could just do age, sure, that's one thing, but what if I wanted, I said that Gen X is uh, sometimes Instagram, sometimes Facebook. Let's say I wanted to grab those together, right? And I wanted to say, okay, I want all the Gen Xers that are likely gonna be more on Facebook uh, combined with the boomers. And then I want all of the Gen Xers that are a little bit younger or identify more, you know, are very much more similar to millennials. Let's put them together so I can identify and target them on Instagram. Well, I don't really know other than age, right? But that's not always an indicator. There's some people who are younger that primarily use Facebook and then some people that are older that primarily use 
Instagram, right? So I want, what are the similarities to where if I have millennials, which Gen Xers are similar to millennials and which are similar to boomers? And that's where um, clustering comes in, right? Is it takes these different tools and it just takes in data and, and uh, sort of clusters together data points that are similar. So if here, if I'm looking at this clustering problem, this, they follow, they, yes, they follow, they're around the same age and then they've been a customer for like a longest time, right? So these two data points, this, this guy and this guy would be what we call clustered together, right? Versus here, they both follow, they're a little bit newer, customer 2018, 2020, similar in age. So they're gonna be clustered together. And this person is 55, been a customer for 2019, but they don't follow. So they're sort of in their own category, right? Their own cluster, their own group together. And so I can use that. And now I can start targeting my data, right? Like this one is um, maybe Instagram, or these are my millennials, and then et cetera, et cetera. Let's say that all of these are Gen Z, but these 43 and 49 are going to be more towards Instagram and 55 is going to be strictly Facebook sort of thing. And now I can target and say, this is the customer that I want to use this advertisement for, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions sort of on clustering? Let's see, uh, K means exam. K means. This data can be used with voice, right? I'm sorry? Like these methods, like they can, you can use like voice with that, like clustering. Like what if do you people mean? had like similar, like, uh, like if everybody was saying the same thing, uh, but they have like, you know, voices aren't exactly the same. So like if everybody was saying the same word. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a big issue, right? With clustering is um, sort of, when you talk about saying the same thing, there's that, but then there's also, let's see. Okay, I mean, there's also um, this idea of like Facebook can sometimes, and they really ran into this in 2020 and 2016, is you can sort of get in a tunnel because it groups cluster, it clusters, you know, for what data you see, it clusters you with like people who are on the same, you know, sort of wavelength or liked the same posts. And so what that does is it actually refines what you're viewing and seeing. And when it comes to from a political standpoint, right, whether you lean to the left or to the right, if you lean to the right, it's going to show you more, uh, you know, right viewing or right focused material videos. If you lean to the left, it's going to show you more left. And so you sort of get in this tunnel where you think, okay, everybody's thinking this way all over my timeline. It's saying so-and-so is going to win the election. And all of a sudden they don't. And you're like, what, how? And it's because it's using these clustering to put you in a group with people who like the same things as you even to the extent of, okay, so let's say you and so-and-so like something and you've liked a couple of the same things or on Instagram. And then maybe, you know, myself and Tyler have liked the same Instagram stuff. And then all of a sudden I go on, you know, there's an Instagram ad and I buy a t-shirt, but because Tyler and I are in the same cluster, it might actually then spark a suggestion to him to buy this t-shirt and say, you know, you might like this. And it's all because him and I are clustered together saying that we are similar. So maybe we might buy something. So from an advertising standpoint, if I buy something, it will suggest it to him because we're clustered together as sort of one, if that makes sense. Um, I want to see visual. So there's a great yeah. visualization. Oh, this one. So here's what I mean by this. So here we have all these different data points, right? And so this is what clustering really, we don't have a target. We don't have, we don't really know. We just have a bunch of data points and this machine learning model will actually gather and create centroids and it'll, you, you can dictate, I want five groups or I want 10 groups or I want X, Y, Z. And then from there, you know, if we say I want four groups, it's gonna put randomly put four centroids there. And then what it's going to do is it's going to align and say, these are the closest data points to the centroid. And then it will um, align and assign data points. And then once it assigns, it'll move the centroid actually to the main portion 
of where all the data points that are that are connected to it. And I'll show you visually what I mean by that. It'll move it uh, to where they're all connected to it. Then it'll reassign and re-see is this data point still closest to this centroid because they've now moved. And then it continues to do that until you get to a spot where it's not going to change. So this is what that means. If I were to look at this. So here we have our data points. And now I've got my four random centroids. I got this yellow, this blue, this green, and this red, right? So then I'm gonna come here and it has now assigned really quickly, see all these lines, red started here, green was here, yellow was here, blue was here. All these lines are all of the data points associated to this centroid, right? These are the closest, this is the closest centroid to this data point and this data point. Then once it assigns all of them, it moves the centroid to the middle and uh, the center of the clusters associated to it. So you can see that red is now moving. And as it's moving, you're seeing these centroids are changing colors, right? Because now red is no longer the closest centroid to this data point. It's now yellow, right? And so it continues to do this. And you see blue, 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 until it gets to a point where it's called a stable solution, where, okay, this is not going to move anymore. Blue started here. And now all of these are more similar than, and these are all the yellow, these are all the green, and these are all the red. So I think it has another, that's a great video. So again, here's some more data points, right? I identify, I want four different uh, groups, four different centroids. It's going to immediately identify right out of the gate, right? This yellow only has four data points and blue has everything. It identifies them and moves them to the center of the centroids that were immediately identified, read the same way. And we're going to quickly see green moves. Now these are changing green and yellow, green and yellow. Now we get to a point where this is stable. It's not going to move anymore. The data points are in their group. And then now I have my group, right? These are my group of millennials, of Gen X, of Gen Z and boomers, right? Something of that nature. And then I can say all of these data points are similar in some way, right? Based off of this machine learning model, these data points are similar. And so that's how like Instagram ads are all based off of this, right? All based off of clustering. I was reading a really fascinating book, again, that Freakonomics book, and it was talking about in 2005. So that's just how it works. Um, in 2005, there was a uh, terrorism attack in London. And what they did is they actually found out that, and I was reading this and I was excited to teach this today because I was like, oh, this is a great example. There's a terrorist attack and they were able to identify the, uh, the terrorist who carried out the attack had a certain bank. And then they looked at the bank account and the different features of that bank account, how often they withdrew, uh, did they have a life insurance policy or not? A couple of different things. And then based off of those, they were able to go and create almost this group, right? This centroid of what it, what it looked like to have, what all the similarities of having a, um, you know, of, of what the terrorists and their money and how it was processing. And they were able to identify and run that through all of their customers in the UK to identify if there was any sort of terroristic terrorist communities within the UK based off these data points, right? It took all of these, it had this centroid and any data points that were similar to that then were identified as as you know, potential terrorists. Now, part of it was, you know, there were different things with naming conventions, right? So first and last name being of a certain ethnicity, which that again comes into this idea of responsible inclusiveness, fairness, right? Just because your name something doesn't, you should never be, you know, uh, identified as a terrorist based off of ethnicity or name. And so then it's like, how do we handle? Are there other features? Are there other things? And and they, were, they had one thing that really cut it in half um, to where they could get really, really close, right? And identified out of 600,000, 30 people who might be domestic terrorists, right? And uh, they wouldn't say what it was because it, for national security purposes, they couldn't give it away. Um, but it's using clustering, right? It's using these things to find like data points, like profiles, stuff like that. And that's how Instagram sells you stuff but it can also be used for like identifying people who might be 
uh, more likely to commit a domestic terrorist attack. Any questions on clustering? I hope you guys find that fascinating because I think that is so cool. Cool. So, okay, talking about the different types of machine learning, Azure, this is specifically towards Azure. So those types are generic, whether it's AWS, GCP, or Azure. Um, now we're, now we're, we're shifting our focus to the Azure machine learning service. So it's a cloud-based model for creating, managing, and publishing machine learning models. So there's a couple things with this. Um, and these are going to be, again, you, you have the slides. So if you don't, like if I go through these quickly, feel free, please just like learn these. But there's automated machine learning, Azure machine learning designer. And that's a real big one. It's a graphical interface, also called like a GUI, graphical user interface. If you've ever heard the word GUI and didn't know what that means, that's what it means, right? Just like a visual click through versus having to go through the code. Enabling no code development, and machine learning solutions. There are pipelines you can create where data scientists or software engineers can define pipelines to orchestrate model training, de uh, deployment, and management tasks. That's what we're gonna little focus on today. There's a cool tool that Azure does have that I do just wanna note. These are all different tools. These are all different things you can use, but it has automated machine learning. So let's say that you are a startup and you guys don't have a data scientist. Or you don't really know what machine learning is trying to do. You could actually um, up upload your data and it will decide what sort of machine learning you need, what algorithm to use. It identifies the features. It's basically like a no code way of using machine learning models. It's a machine learning system to detect and create your own machine learning system, which is kind of cool. But again, the one we're going to sort of focus on is the machine Azure machine learning designer. Um, Do they allow so you to hard code if you need it? I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's where this uh, data scientist, the pipeline. So uh, that pipeline and the data and compute management where you can upload your code and then use their computing power to do that same sort of thing. Cool. So what it does is it allows us to use a GUI uh, to drag graphical user interface. Uh, again, just like a, like a window that we can visually see to uh, drag and drop machine learning tasks to execute a machine learning pipeline. So, um, so in this section, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go over the steps for machine learning and how it's displayed in Azure Machine Learning Designer. In order for us to train and deploy uh, our models, we need to compute on which, we, you need compute on which to run, you need to wait to train models using Azure Machine Learning Designer, you need compute on which to run the train, training process and to test. Oh, we need to compute. That's an error, sorry about that. I was very confused. We need to compute and test the train model after deploying it. So basically we create it, we compute it, and then we uh, test it. And then we make sure, okay, this is working. This is, this is good. And there's different things uh, assigned with that. Now there's different types of computing. Um, there's computing instances, computing clusters, attached compute. Um, so there's different types of computing that we can use in the different, you know, and they all sort of handle different things, whether it's uh, attached compute is links to existing compute resources. So let's say you're working for a big organization and they already have this, right? It already has a tool that is computing that. So like a virtual machine or a data brick already is handling big data. We can just attach that to our model and take that data, right? I don't need to clean the model. I don't need to do all that. If my company's already doing it. I just want to do something different with that data. I can attach that computing service. I can create a development workstation that data scientists can use uh, to work with our data and models. So I can actually create a model and, and allow my data scientists to use that test train split and use that at uh, different instances. And so what we're really gonna focus on for us are the compute instance. So uh, when creating a machine learning model, we're gonna use a compute instance, right? And then when we're deploying our model, we're going to use an inference cluster. So again, a compute instance is a, a development workstation that data scientists can use to work with data and models, right? So it's us actually working with the data and making predictions. And then our inference cluster is deployment targets for predictive services that, you, that use your uh, trained model. So after we've trained it, after we created it, we have our different um, clusters. So we can import the data from the web or manually. Um, so first step number one is we have to get our data, right? I can either get that from somewhere on the web or I can upload a bunch of data, my user data. Let's say that I, again, I've got a database online. 
right? Using Azure, or maybe I'm using AWS. I can go and import that data to my machine learning model if I need, or I can just upload it. If I have my own database, I manage my own database. I can upload that manually. And again, I'm going to target, uh, this is for our supervised. I'm going to target a target column, right? What am I trying to predict or a label column? So here I've uploaded my data. Now I need to add my data transformations. So this is selecting my features that I'm going to use, right? Which columns do I want to use in this data set? Um, I need to clean missing data and I need to normalize data. Now let's, we'll, we'll talk about all of those here in a second. When I'm, when I'm dealing with my data transformations, let's say that uh, there, is a, there is a process called feature selection or featureization where I choose which features I want to use, right? So let's say I'm, I'm uh, uploading car information we're like uh, Kelly Blue Book and I'm uploading car information, how many miles, how many, you know, uh, services, has it been in an accident, X, Y, Z. So I'm picking which ones I want in order for me to predict my um, car price. Now there might be columns that I actually don't need. So maybe previous owner isn't going to affect the price at all, right? It doesn't matter if Will owned it or if, if you know, uh, Larry owned it. It doesn't matter unless maybe maybe it's like a, if you have like a exclusive owned by celebrities sort of website or model that maybe if it's owned by Oprah, it's going to affect the price. But typically it's not going to if you have a user, but there's another thing that we can also do. So we have selected and deselected features, right? Saying uh, it doesn't matter who used to own it uh, or what the car's name was, that doesn't matter. But let's say that I want actually a column that doesn't exist in my data, but I think it'll be useful. Let's say it is uh, average annual miles driven, right? Maybe I have the total miles and how old the car is, but I don't have a column for annual mileage driven. I can do something called feature engineering, meaning that I can actually create that. I can create a column that takes the amount of years the car is, has been since it was created and the total amount of miles and basically, right, divide the two. And then I get an average of how many miles per year it was driven. And so maybe if I wanted to create that, and I think that would be useful, that's what we call feature engineering. I'm creating a column that doesn't exist in my data using my information within my data set to create something new that I think would be useful. Second thing is we have to clean our missing data. We cannot have missing data in our data set for machine learning. There's a couple of options we have. If my data is, you know, if a row is missing a ton of data, I can just drop that row. We typically don't, we want to keep as much data as we can. Uh, so I don't want to always just drop everything. So what I might do is let's say that uh, something's missing. I might just take the average of that column and say, okay, that's the value. Cause it's not really going to skew. It's not an outlier. It's just, let's just take the average. It's not really going to affect it that much. That's one way to do it. There's other ways to do it as well. Um, but we want to make sure that no matter what, there is no missing data within my data set. It has to have data in every column that I choose to use. And the last one is called normalizing data. And this one's really, really, really important um, because many machine learning models are distance based, meaning that the distance between numbers affects the um, focus or affects the importance of a column. So let's say I'm, I'm dealing with a, a car, right? We're, we're using our car thing. If I've got two columns, one is miles per gallon and one is miles on the car. Well, one is going to range between, you know, anywhere from 50 if it's a Prius to eight, if it's an old truck, right? So 50 to eight, but then miles could be like 100,000. Now that is going to skew my model because it's going to take the larger values and put more importance on that column. It's going to put more importance on the, um, the miles driven versus the miles per gallon. So what we do in data science is we do something called normalizing it, where we take the column, right? And we do this with, with most numbers. We take the column and we take the lowest value in the column and assign that to the number zero. And we take the highest column or highest value in the column and assign that to the number one. Then for every other number in, pro in, in proportion to our zero and one, we assign a value of like 0.75 or 0.63, right? Whatever, however close it is to the number one and the number two, and there's tools that do that. We don't have to like do the math. There's tools that we can do to normalize that data. We're gonna do that with our miles per gallon and we're gonna do that with our miles driven. Because now when it's 
comparing these numbers, the maximum miles driven, let's say it's 500,000 of a car, that's still just the number one to our machine learning model. And then, you know, if it's a brand new car and two miles have been driven, that's zero, right? And then so somewhere in between zero and one is all the miles and its associated number. So that way it's not putting priority on the miles driven and sort of excluding the miles per gallon. It's putting them on even playing field so they hold the same weight. So that's what we call normalizing data. And it's, it's really like normally numeric values to where we're gonna, we're gonna really deal with that because it will artificially distort our prediction if we leave them as normal numbers. It's called a min-max scalar. So it's between zero and one. Cool, so we've gotten our data, we've selected columns and we've changed our data and we selected the columns we want, we've cleaned our data. And this is just how it would look on Azure if, if I was using Azure. But I would select the columns by name, pick which columns I want. Then I would clean my missing data. Then I normalize my data. So it's all a process. Again, this is how you clean them. Um, and then this is what it would look like if you normalize them. So here's the ones I want to normalize, the wheelbase, the curb height, the compression ratio, city miles per gallon, highway miles per gallon, the horsepower, right? All of this stuff is really important. So once all that's complete, we have uh, transformed our data. Now we want to train our data. Uh, so we want to train our machine learning models with our data, right? And to do that, first we split our data. It's called a test, uh, test train split, where we're going to take a portion, like 75% of our data, and we're going to train our model on that data. Then what that does is allows us 25% as a validation set. That is data that the model hasn't seen before. And we can see how does it work with data that it's seen. And then if we introduce new data, how accurate is that? How accurate is our model? And that's our uh, validation set. So we split our data into training and a validation set. So we split our data into that, which is what I just said. Then after we split our data, we want to add our training module. Now, again, there's three different types that we're really working with, regression, classification, and clustering. And with those, there's three real algorithms that we're going to work with for the different type. Now for our regression, we're going to use a linear regression model. Okay, so when we do that, we're going to pick, okay, we want to use this regression. I'm trying to predict a house price or car price. I'm going to use linear regression. Now for classification, this is a little bit confusing. I'm not going to get into the math of using like the sigmoid function for the logistic regression. But for classification, the word we use is logistic regression. Although it has the word regression in there, logistic regression is for classification. Logistic regression is for classification. Um, so please know that. And then for clustering, it again is the k-means, which is what the visually what I showed you how that worked. It just uses k-means for clustering. That's going to be the three that uh, Azure is really going to focus on. So again, linear regression is for a regression model. Logistic regression is for a classification model. And then k-means is for our clustering model. So what linear regression is, is it's just going to create a regression point uh, with our data points. That way we can predict what that price is when it goes, you know, for our X and Y axis. It returns a probability. Um, this is our logistic regression. So not our linear regression. It's our logistic regression. It uses something called a sigmoid function to return a probability between zero and one of being in the positive class being one um, or, you know, of the negative class being zero. This is typically used for binary classification problems. Idea is, do they have diabetes or not? right? Uh, are they going to pass their exam or not? That's where we're typically going to use logistic regression. Now you can use it um, for other ones, but it's a little bit more complicated. There are better models for that. But typically for binary classification problems, we want to use our logistic regression model. And then again, our K means, um, so in initializing K coordinates, which are centroids, uh, K meaning however many groups we want, so if we want three or five or however many that is, it creates that many centroids. 
plots them randomly and then moves them uh, accordingly. And so it continues to, to uh, do that until it stabilizes and it's not going to move anymore. Again, this is exactly what I showed you that those, all those dots and it moving differently. That's what the k-means clustering. That was just a visual representation of k-means. So we're going to add and and pick. Uh, we're going to we're going to split our data. We're going to pick which model we want. What are we trying to do? And then we're going to do something called training our model. So we're going to apply the k-means to our data. And once we do that, we get its prediction, and then we score it and say, okay, how good did that do? So how do we score that model? It's seeing how our model performs on our validation set. So once we train it, right, we give it the model, we have our training data, we train our model. Then what we're going to do is we're going to give it our validation set, that little bit of data that we held to the side. We're going to give it that validation set. And then we're going to see, well, which, um, you know, how does it perform? And then we can tune it, right? We can add different things to it. But how does it perform on data it's never seen before? on our validation set. We can also use something called cross-validation. Um, so it's picking new validation sets and scoring our model on each of these validation sets to see how our model performs on many unseen data sets. So it's just another way that we can uh, sort of score our model. And so this is what it looks like visually. And on the exam, what it'll do is it might have, uh, you know, three of these missing. And then it'll say, you know, let's say these three are missing and it's saying, oh, drag and drop into the correct area. So select columns, clean missing data, normalize data. It wants you to do that, right? It might have five or six different things and it'll have you pull them over and drag and drop them into the correct uh, form. So once all this is done, I have taken in my data. I've selected the columns I want to use. I clean my missing data. I've then normalized my data. I've split my data into my train test validation. I've picked which model I want to use. I train it. I train the model, this model on this data. Then I take my validation set and I score it. So I run my extra bit of data through my now trained model and see how well it does. And at the end of that, I evaluate and say, how good did it do? How good did my model do? Um, there's different ways that we can do that for different things, right? So it's a, a evaluation metric to see how good of a job our model does at correctly predicting our target. And there's different things we can use to see if it did really good or not, right? So when we're dealing with regression evaluation metrics, so this is for a regression, we are trying to predict a numerical value. Uh, there's a couple of different ones that we can use. We can do the mean absolute error, meaning the average distance between predicted values and true values. So this is um, a value based on the same units as a label. If I predicted, let's say I'm predicting a car and I predicted $10,000 less or $10,000 over, I'm, I just was off by $10,000, right? So that's this absolute value. Just how much was I off, right? It doesn't matter if I was off $10,000 less or $10,000 over. Either way, I was off by $10,000 sort of thing. Then there's a root mean squared error um, where it basically takes the mean difference and then it, square, it squares it and then takes the square root of that. Um, and then that is really a bigger deal when we are having a larger difference, right? So it's really going to uh, be a little bit more restrictive on that. So it really will uh, exemplify or really, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of bring, bring to light. If you are over, it's going to be a bigger deal, right? And then the last one is our coefficient of determination. Now there are values. There are, um, I mean, it's, it's like a, you bring in a class sort of thing. So you don't have to write like the coefficient of determination in your code. There's just classes you use and then you run it through. Um, so this, this coefficient of determination is just uh, commonly referred to as R squared. And it summarizes how much of the variance between the predicted and the true values is, is explained by the model. So the closer we get to this uh, one on this value, the better our model is performing. So the closer we get to one, the better of our model is performing. When it comes to classification, right? So that was all regression. Classification, we use something called our confusion matrix. This can be, it's in the name, a little bit confusing. 
but it basically takes the what we predicted was a one and what was actually a one and what we predicted was a one and this is actually a zero. Same thing if, if we predicted a zero, but it was actually a one, there's 612 that we predicted. Nope, it's a zero and it was actually a one. And 2,677 we predicted was a zero and is actually a zero. So it's just a two by two grid to show what we predicted and what it actually was. Now with that, we care about accuracy, precision, and recall. And there's different things and the different uh, ratios to use for accuracy. It's true positives, meaning what did we uh, predict that was truly, what did we predict correctly? And what did we, that was, you know, so this guy, so we predicted, um, we predicted one and it was one. And this guy, we predicted zero and it was zero. So that's how accurate were we there? So in other words, what proportion of diabetes predictions did the model get right? Then we've got the uh, precision. So the fraction of positive cases correctly identified. So the number of positives divided by the number of true positives plus false positives. So what is the total number of positives here, right? So this total number uh, divided by this plus this, right? So this is a um, false positive, right? I predicted that this was positive and is not. That's what we call a false positive or a false negative. I predicted zero, but it's actually a one. And the last one would be recall. So the fraction of the cases classified as positive that are actually positive. So the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus the number of false negatives. So in other words, out of all the patients who actually have diabetes, how many did the model identify? And then for precision, is of all the patients that the model predicted as having diabetes, how many of them actually had diabetes? Then there's some other ones. There's the F1 score, which is just an overall metric, and the AUC, which is going to be big uh, for like a logistic regression. And it just shows, because remember, logistic regression gives you a probability of zero or one if it's in this class or not. Just knowing that if our model ever, uh, if our AUC of a model is ever lower than 0.5, that means our, our model is actually performing worse than randomly guessing, right? If it's one of two, it's like flipping a coin. You have a 50-50 chance of landing on heads or tails. If our AUC is anywhere below 0.5, let's say it's 0.34, you would actually be better off just randomly guessing if this is one or the other, right? If let's say it's cancer, right? Uh, or if they have diabetes, it'd be better if you randomly guess if they had diabetes than if you used your model to predict if they had diabetes or not. So anything from an a AUC, if it's anything lower than five or 0.5, your model is not good. Well, never, don't use that. You need to change it and uh, do some different things. And then from a clustering, so yeah, just retire. From the clustering side, we don't really have evaluation metrics. There are some, they're pretty uh, math heavy that are some that are used in the industry, but from a classification or a clustering, sorry, from a clustering side, we don't really have that. It's not something you really need to worry about here. So, okay. The last part is we evaluate our model. Then at the end, after creating and running a pipeline to train our model, we create an inference pipeline. So we do everything. We create this. We have our model. We get it to where it is working. It's scored well. And then I can just bring in that information, right? So here's my model that when I apply the transformation to this new set of data, I want to make sure, okay, that it cleans and uses the features I want it to use, right? It normalizes the data. Here's the uh, model that I want to use. On this, on this data that uh, has been transformed, right? And I want this new data, I wanna use that. I wanna use the Python script and then I show, show it. So if I go to Kelly Blue Book, this is what's happening, right? I input some data, right? Then it's going to, I, I input the certain bits of data, the how many miles, what year, what the make, the model, all that stuff is. It applies the transformations, it does everything, it runs through the model and it spits out my, price that my car is worth. Cool. Any questions there? Oh, that was a lot. That was the most intense, heavy, like verbiage word that we, uh, the, the next part is my favorite part. We're going to learn about computer vision and NLPs and it's really sick after lunch, but any questions there? 
Uh, you talked about AUC. Um, can you explain again? I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. So AUC is called the area under the curve. And so without actually seeing it, there's, it basically creates a line and the logistic re regression creates what we call a sigmoid function. It sort of looks like an S. And so under that, it's the area under the curve. And it's just a way that you can evaluate a classification model and it'll generate a number. And so if a number is under 0.5, your model is performing worse than if you were randomly guessing. So it's just a, another tool that you can use for um, you like to evaluate a classification. It's really big with logistic regression. Okay, so it's kind of like, uh, um, like you mentioned, randomly guesses so, if it's diabetic or not. So what it does is it, um, it takes, so here's the explanation of exactly what it does, but basically it plots and then it has our curve, our ROC curve, and then it generates this, um, let me see if I can see. So I, because sometimes visually it's, it's much easier. Let's see. Let's see. So it plots this. Um, so let's say that we've got our true positive rate and our false positive rate, and that's our ROC, and that's the area under the curve, right? And that is what can designate and give us a number. That's not a great example. Let me see. Uh, let me pull up our platform for our data science. So here's a, a great video of what it looks like, but here's our baseline. And then our AUC here is uh, 0.96, right? So our baseline AUC is 0.5. If we're to look at this here, under this is our AUC, right? And so because it's 0.96, it's really, really great. It's, it's, a, it's a really awesome model. 0.5 is equivalent to me guessing. So if it's anything under that, it's actually better for me to guess than to use this model particularly. Oh, so it's okay. Just, it's just a classification. So like I was showing with the confusion matrix, it's a way, and I'll give you this. Um, I don't want to watch this video, but let's see. Hmm. here. So here's my, here's my um, baseline, right? My 0.5. And this is my curve, my ROC curve. So it's area under the curve. And the closer I get to this 0.5, the worse I am, right? But the farther out I get, the better my model is, right? Right here, the AUC is the area under the curve. This is my curve. Right. And so the, the better this is, is the better that my model has run. Okay. It's, it's just, it's just an evaluation tool in the same way that we've got like a, um, like the confusion mm -hmm. matrix is an evaluation tool. It's another way that we can evaluate as well. So this is mainly used for classification. Yeah. It's only used for classification. Yeah. Only used for, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah just a classification evaluation metric. What was the clustering um, evaluation? Does, they don't have one. They don't have, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not really. Nothing you have to focus on. Cool. Any other questions? Great questions though. And just our inference pipeline is, okay, what does it look like now? It's, it's pushed out into the cloud. What does that look like? Any other questions? Okay, usually we do uh, instructions here. What I'm actually going to do is just put this in the chat and you can just kind of go through it at lunch and then we'll, um, 
show it at the beginning of at the beginning of lunch or when we come back we'll just sort of you know walk through what this would look like if we were to do this again you're going to have to make a copy uh entire presentation and then once you do that then you'll be able to move it but this is just more of an idea of if you were on the exam it's not going to have you do all of them but if you were on the exam what does it look like to drag and drop right okay i want to take in my data then i would need to do what and then do what and then do what where does all this go? And that's similar to what it looks like on the exam. You'll have this and say, okay, well, you have your data, blah, 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 but where does the split data go? Where does the train model go? Where does the normalized data go? And those are the three that you need to do. And so it'll give you those and you have to put them in the correct area. So this one's clustering. Um, so you're gonna have to use your sort of thought process for what we've learned about clustering. Um, and then this one's our classification. So, cool. Well, it is 1210. Uh, so let's do this. Let me pause the recording.